he's a student of Japanese, and we are going to um, talk about language learning as usual. So, Matt, you have the floor. Yeah, thank yeah, thanks for having me on. It's really an honor. I've been a big fan for for so long, so uh, I'm so glad that this is happening. Yeah, I've been studying Japanese for seven, maybe almost eight years now, and the first five of those were were very intensive. Now, recently, I'm also just starting to kind of dabble with Chinese, and I have a YouTube channel where I talk a lot about uh, learning languages, Japanese in particular, and I kind of specialize in people who really want to try to reach uh, some of the highest levels of fluency as a, a foreign language learner of languages. So, uh -huh. so when you say you uh, studied uh, Japanese very intensively for the, did you say the first five years? Mm -hmm. And so what did that consist of? So the first six months, I was still just in America. And so I focused really heavily on input. I actually was really inspired by this website called All Japanese All the Time, which was created by a guy who had, uh, who was really inspired by Stephen Crash and input-like techniques, but he really took it to the extreme. And his philosophy was, you know, it doesn't really matter where your body is physically, whether you're in the country or not, what matters is what's in the three foot radius of you. And so like he said, like I following his advice, I switched all my devices into Japanese. I started to just only watch Japanese movies and listen to Japanese stuff. And uh, although I didn't really understand that much at first, I still just kind of stuck with it. And then I also used uh, Anki spaced repetition system to slowly build my kind of conscious knowledge of the language and slowly became able to be able to understand more and more of the input that I was getting so much of. And I didn't focus at all on speaking at the beginning, just trying to understand things. And then six months in, I went to Japan for a study abroad and I continued to like live my life entirely in Japanese over there. And of course made a lot of progress. And then when I came back, I still- uh, How long were you in Japan? Just six months. So okay. you studied intensively in the States for six months. Then you went to Japan for six months. Did you go to school in Japan or what did you do? Yeah, yeah. I was going to high school in Japan and it was actually- well, Were you uh, in high school with Japanese kids then at a Japanese Yes, high yes. And so they just stuck me in biology class, like pre-calc and everything, all in Japanese. And so I obviously wasn't understanding a lot of that. And it was actually kind of a rough experience because I think the, the school that they sent me to was very focused on English. And I think the reason why they had me uh, you know, as a foreign exchange student there was because they thought it would help the, you know, encourage the students to be more interested in English and study English more. And so it was really about them. And they didn't really, uh, like, they didn't really have a place for me in the school. Like, I wasn't actually on the attendance list, and they kind of just let me sit in the corner. Where were and you? I was in Guma Prefecture, which is like a few hours outside of Tokyo. Right. And it's not not really too uh, famous for anything. Like when I tell my Japanese friends now I was in Guma, they're like, why'd you go to Guma? Right. But that was where they sent me. But, but also, I think it probably wouldn't have made too much of a difference for me at the time where I was in, in Japan. But yeah, but I so I, I kind of was isolated in Japan because most of the kids at school were so focused on their studies because it was like a very intensive school. But I really just focused on studying Japanese. I focused a lot on trying to learn how to read. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time trying to read books. And so, uh, in your first six months at home, before like in the States, before you went mm -hmm. to Japan, you didn't do any reading in Japan? In uh, Japan? I, I did do, do reading, but I wasn't really at the point where I could read novels or anything. Oh, so right. I, focused, I focused a lot on watching Japanese uh, TV shows with Japanese subtitles. like mm -hmm. with, uh, And I had some Japanese comic books, too, that I, that I was reading a lot of. But when I got to Japan, I was really excited to be able to jump into like paper books with, you know, no pictures or anything, just text. Right. And so, uh, like, I think it took me one month to work my way through my first like short novel that, that was still pretty yeah. easy. Yeah. And so, yeah, when I came. So, oh, then, yeah. so that's yeah. a year. Then you came back to the States. Yeah. And I was I had made tons of improvement, but I still really wasn't where I wanted to be because uh, the guy who I, who I was really inspired by, who made that website, he had some pretty unrealistic claims on there. Where my impression, as like you know, a seventeen-year-old reading the site, was, oh, in like you know, one or two years, I'll basically be perfect in Japanese. Right. And so, of course, I was nowhere close to that. So, uh, but what I also, did, what, mm -hmm. what did you sense? What was the sort of the gap between where you thought you were and where you wanted to be? Well, actually. By the time I came back from Japan, I kind of realized that my delusion I had about what fluency was, which was basically that it was an on-off switch, like you wake up one day, you don't know the language, you wake up the next day, and now you're perfect. 
I'd already realized that that's not how it works and that language ability is just a spectrum. And I'd already realized from my own experience that the way to improve is just continue to get more exposure. And you know, when you expose yourself to one domain of the language, you slowly get more and more comfortable with it. So my experience was that in the very limited domains that I had spent the most time in, I was quite comfortable, but there were so many other domains. And just because I was comfortable in say like watching certain genre of cartoons or reading one genre of books that didn't automatically extend out so that I could watch the news or nice. understand textbooks or understand like internet slang or anything. And so uh, I kind of just stayed, uh, I just kept immersing myself even in America. Like I still spent many hours reading Japanese books and watching Japanese movies. And when I went to college, I there were a lot of Japanese exchange students. So I hung out with them all the time. And, and so I feel that after I came back from Japan, after another two years of studying really intensively, like I think almost a, another Are year and a half. Horses in Japanese at university in the States? Yeah, they did. They had Japanese courses that I took when I went to college because I I wanted a degree, but I never liked studying in school. I liked doing my own thing. Right. And so because I had already spent so much time studying Japanese on my own, actually, when I went to college, I thought I would study psychology. But when I realized how much work that would be, and it's the kind of work I didn't enjoy doing, I switched over to studying Japanese just because I knew it would be easy for me because I'd already spent so much time studying it on my I own. Mean, you would have been much further along than any of the yeah. other students. I mean, presumably it, they were teaching you things that you already knew. Yeah, it was it was it was really a joke. But like I took a placement test when I went there and they told me, oh yeah, you're you're not you're not too good for our, our system. You we have a place for you. You're you just happen to be right at the highest level. And they put me at the highest level and it was still quite easy. For sure, yeah. Um, but there was a lot of foreign exchange students there, which was what right. really helped. And so I, you know, they had Japanese people especially like to really stick together. And so there was this group of Japanese people who would just sit in one place in the cafeteria and just only speak Japanese and not ever try to practice English. And part of me said, thought that and was, and was like, come on, what are you guys doing? You came all the way here. Like, like stop, like stop speaking Japanese, go learn English. But at the same time, I was like, oh, awesome opportunity. Right. And so I would go and, and just speak Japanese with them. And so I really found in my experience that it wasn't too big of a drawback that I was not physically in Japan because I just really went out of my way to spend time in Japanese here. I also know there's lots of foreigners who live in Japan for years and do the opposite and make a little English bubble. Right. And and so after uh, an, another two years after staying uh, studying in America, I found that I was a lot more comfortable calling myself like fluent in Japanese. And then after another two years, I was starting to really get to the point where uh, you know, if I was interested in a topic, I could just pull a book off the shelf and read it in Japanese and just happen to be in Japanese. Uh, it wasn't really like a language learning exercise or anything. It felt kind of similar to when I would read a book uh, wow. in English. But still, at the same time, I also recognized there were so many gaps between me and a native speaker. And I still feel that. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of I kind of let go of my initial aspiration to somehow become a the equivalent of a native speaker in Japanese mm -hmm. in every single way. Because right. I've kind of realized that's a little bit unrealistic, but mm -hmm. I still like to slowly like find out where my weaknesses are and brush up on those one at a time over time. And so I'm still I still inspired to keep moving forward. So what are you doing now? So now I, I have a YouTube channel and a Patreon account where I talk a lot about my experiences learning Japanese very intensively, especially outside of Japan. Mm -hmm. And also uh, like I'm, I'm running a website. Me and my friend have kind of created a website uh, that massimmersionapproach.com, where we talk about using input-based methods uh, in a kind of more intensive way. For it's kind of you know our demographic is people who like structure and also like to be very intensive. So that's right. a really specific demographic. But we, uh, we kind of talk about I kind of talk about doing uh, what what I did and how to do it. And also my friend uh, Yoga is his kind of online name. He's a programmer, and so we make our own little tools to help optimize. Uh, the process like ways to make it easier to learn from subtitles if you have the subtitles to it from like a tv show or make it really easy to read books and turn them into onky cards and things like that so what is so two questions first of all what what is a j a t t like people often ask me what do you think of a j a t t yeah yeah i don't know so, i don't I've never done a j a t t so what does it consist of okay so i call it a jet and and so all Japanese all the time. So basically this guy, his online internet name is Katsumoto. He claimed to, when he was 21 years old, 
while going to college in the United States and also having two part-time jobs, he started learning Japanese and through immersing himself close to 24 hours a day, including sleeping time, because he, he kept Japanese playing while he was asleep, he claimed to be able to reach fluency in just 18 months. And then as he graduated, he uh, interviewed with a Japanese company and got, the, got a job at Sony and, and flew over to Japan happily ever after. And so his method was, first of all, uh, like because his philosophy, which I used to really subscribe to for a long time, and now I've kind of seen that it's kind of a simplification of the reality of language learning, but largely still uh, effective, is basically adults are entirely equivalent to children when it comes to language learning. So if you completely replicate what a children uh, went through when they're learning the first language, you will be able to achieve similar results. And what that mainly consists of is just thousands and thou thousands of hours of exposure to the language. And he kind of was of the philosophy of if you give your brain enough opportunities, your brain will figure it out for you, you'll acquire it. One of his sayings was you don't learn a language, you get used to a language. And he also combined that with the a spaced repetition system and a technique called sentence mining, where you would find set I plus one sentences or sentences that grow your knowledge by just a little bit and make flash and then, you know, put that on the front of a flashcard and then put the definition of the unknown word on the back. Uh, he was also a, pro a proponent of using monolingual dictionaries early on. So you're learning the language in the language when you need to, and then also input before output. So maybe go th at, at the beginning, focus more on trying to understand and then, and try not to make up the language because it's not really a creative process because the natives tend to say things in, in the same ways every time. And if you don't know the way a native would express a certain idea and you make up your own way, they might understand you, but it's not going to be native like. So if you really want to sound like a native, then you have to just get lots of input and basically learn how it's done instead of trying to recreate it yourself. Okay. And so that's basically it, right? What you've described, in other words, massive immersion, almost yeah, yeah. extreme immersion. I think, the, sleep. I think the, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that AJAT was kind of a reaction against the language community of the time, which was very grammar heavy, no immersion mm -hmm. heavy. It was people saying, right. oh, I'm, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to read. Mm -hmm. Whatever caused it. The method was massive immersion, including when you're asleep. That's point number one. And point number two, well, three things, an input. In other words, you have to get used to the language before you can hope to express anything in the language. And three, uh, lots of spaced repetition. Yeah. With an emphasis on sentences. Yeah. OK. And so in what, how does your system now, you have a new system that you mm -hmm. and your friend are doing, and how is it different? Or what are the okay. features? Well, I would say it's a little bit of, of a remix of it. And I think the core principles are pretty much the same. But what I found is that if you are just getting exposure to the language and you're just focusing on understanding, although you pick up a lot of stuff and like, like I, I think, I think at, especially at the beginning, you, you understand more and more and more, your understanding grows very rapidly and you acquire everything you're listening to. But once you get to the point where you can understand almost everything and you're quite comfortable, you know, you become able to output. And as you continue to speak more and get more input, your output gets better and better. But eventually there's kind of a plateau that you reach where if you keep doing what you're doing, just getting lots of exposure and using the language, you kind of, the, your improvements start to become very, very gradual and much, much slower, yet there'll still be a gap between you and a native speaker. And I think that if you want to close that gap, you have to assess what you're missing and then train yourself to pay attention to that in your input. Like, for example, one thing that I realized in my Japanese was I never really paid attention to the pitch accent. I kind of just uh, assumed that, oh, I'll just naturally pick it up over time. And I found that I picked up parts of it, but there were other big parts that I seemed to have not picked up. And I never seemed to be getting better at it, even though I was immersing and listening to Japanese all the time. So I did a little bit of studying about it and I trained myself to start really paying attention to it and seeing what was happening. Is there anything else besides the pitch accent? Uh. Well, yeah, I mean, things like the, the nuances of Kegel in Japanese, like uh, all the nuances of what love, like what level of politeness is what and when it's used. Okay, so that's two, level of politeness. What else? Mm, uh, like, f well, foods and things like that I'm pretty bad at, uh, like specific animals. I noticed there's a kind of tendency for me to just go, oh, food or animal and wouldn't really know what they were till I kind of really went on my way to pay attention. Special And, and uh yeah, and numbers too. Numbers, it, it took quite a bit of effort to to really get good at the numbers because you know they have the different unit. They have mon as 10,000 as one unit. And so I realized for a while in my mind when I heard a big number, I just go, oh, big number. And I wouldn't really train myself to 
to process exactly what that was. So I right. started practicing that more and yeah. and also just uh, like place names and like, cause there's a lot of cultural knowledge that natives have that uh, they all share and come up often. And so I found I found that when I started going out of my way to try to, you know, when, when someone mentions an event in history or a pop culture thing, if you just like look it up and read the wick, like the first paragraph on the Wikipedia thing, then the next time it comes up, you're like, oh, it's that thing. And so. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, as I listen to all of this, I'll give you my reaction. Um, first of all, I can't imagine 24 hour exposure to a language. Um, you know, I have a, a family, I have my wife, I see people socially, I just can't spend my whole time surrounded by Japanese. That's just not practical. And I like to sleep at night. So I certainly wouldn't put Japanese on while I'm sleeping. I, I just don't understand that. But if he's able to do that, that's fine. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. And I don't think for most people that it's practical. Um, I, I see a lot of this reference to sentences. Um, like I'm not a big user of space repetition. Uh, I'm a big believer in massive input that you improve your ability to read and listen. And the more you read, the more different words, uh, words and phrases are going to show up. Uh, sentences are far more individual, like every sentence to some extent is different from every other sentence. Phrases tend to repeat, so I tend to focus more on phrases, but I do agree on the importance of lots of input. Um, I don't use, uh, because I have a limited amount of time to spend, like even in this past, you know, 90 day period where I've been working very hard on my Persian and Arabic, I've only got two, three hours a day that I can spend. I still have to, my wife likes to talk to me, you know, and I have other activities, uh, sports or whatever. So if I get involved in a spaced repetition system, I'm just concerned that I'd end up spending half an hour, an hour a day on all the words that I'm trying to learn. Whereas I'm happier coming across these words and phrases in interesting content. Although in many cases at an early stage, I'm going over the same beginner content over and over and over again. But each time I'm focusing in on different words and different phrases, I, I find that easier to do because I just do it while I'm, I'm listening. I don't really sit down and do flashcards for half an hour. But that's just me. A lot of people, I know a lot of people like Anki, Memorize, and like doing spaced repetition. Um, as for, you know, the idea that you're going to have as much knowledge about all things cultural as a Japanese person who grew up with that, who had it in school, who reads widely in Japanese. I mean, the more you read, the more you listen, the closer you get to it. Uh, and certainly for me, living in Japan, doing business in lumber, where we're talking numbers all the time. We're talking numbers in cubic meters, in board feet, in dollars, in yen, because I'm constantly dealing with numbers. Numbers was dead easy. Uh, and I had it from Chinese. So it's like everything that, as you said at the beginning, if you're, if you're focused on a particular area, you're going to become very competent in that area, the vocabulary, the background, the references. But a native speaker is always going to have a bigger vocabulary than you, is always going to have much more exposure to the overall culture. You might be more knowledgeable about some specific areas of interest to you that, you know, if a Japanese person is not interested in anime, you might know more about anime than they do. But on balance, the native speaker has had much more exposure. So the fact that I'm not totally competent in all aspects of Japanese or anything else doesn't bother me in the slightest, you know. I don't know that for the average person, that's a realistic goal. When I think of all the people that I deal with in English, who have gaps in their knowledge of English culture, American culture, who have accents, who, you know, frequently make the same mistakes. Like German people say, since many years, you know, in other words, we say for, for a long, like we would say, like I have been living in the United States for a long time. And they would say, I've been living in the United States since a long time. Big deal. You know, I'm not such a perfectionist that I would pursue all of these things. And I have to admit that I have no idea what pitch is. I have never been interested in pitch and I can communicate very comfortably in Japanese. So if a person really wants to try to totally nail down Japanese pronunciation, I guess pitch becomes important, but it's not ever, it's not something that I've never ever really uh, worked on. So uh, it's interesting. I, I just think that people have different goals.
Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that, so I would not, uh, you know, and, and the other thing too is uh, people often say, you know, to me or a more extreme case would be Moses McCormick, you know, what's the point of going after so many languages when you're not perfect in any one of them? And obviously, I'm quite prepared to be imperfect in a lot of languages. Whereas in your case, you're focusing on one and you want to be as complete as you can in one. So all of these things are choices. And so for different choices, there are different solutions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, to ad address some of that, like, first of all, I'm with you on the 24 hours a day thing not being realistic. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that, like, really, when I first started my YouTube channel, I was just calling it Aja. But mm -hmm. I decided eventually to switch the name just because, first of all, I was tinkering with things here and there, and it wasn't my method. And so mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to conflate what I was doing with the original method and just, like, you know, steal someone else's brand. Uh, right. And also, one of the problems with the original method is all that the core philosophy is just get a lot of input, you right. know, get a lot of exposure because of like the website is very quirky and, and it's hard to navigate. And he has a very weird writing style that turns a lot of people off. And he's just so extreme, right? Like he said things that are crazy. Like I think listening while you're sleeping is also crazy. He also said, eat, eat all your food with chopsticks, even in America. Like if you're going to eat a cake or ice cream, eat it with chopsticks. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it's not really practical. It's, it's, it's kind of just his own quirky thing. And so I'm, I'm kind of trying to translate the core philosophy that's important to a broader audience because a lot of people mm -hmm. are just not going to get on board with that. They're going to be turned off by the other stuff. And so uh, I, I know that like most people probably, if they can get like three, four hours a day of, of real time, quality time with the language, that, that's really great. And more than that's probably unrealistic. Uh, and I think that you can make tons of progress. How about one hour a day? How about one hour a day? I think most people would be very happy to get in one hour a day, which I think you can only achieve if you focus on listening. Because it's for most people who have jobs or other activities to sit down and read or, or in front of their computer. I mean, one hour a day, I can fit that in because I'm in my car, because I'm doing the dishes. I can get in that much listening and hopefully get another half hour on my iPad uh, at link going through what I was listening to. Max. Yeah, I mean, Max. I, that, that, but I mean, the reality is that if you're only spending like one hour a day, for example, on Japanese and you're a native English speaker and you know, this is your, your first foreign language, like it's going to take you 10 years before you can just watch a movie with no subtitles and comfortably understand the whole thing because Japanese is just so different than English. Like I found it took me so long, even though I was spending so many hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, re the reality is that like, yeah, it's a big commitment. It's, it's a big thing. Like, uh, the way I kind of think about it is, is like when you think about how much time, you know, uh, someone who was wanting to be a professional athlete would put in, I mean, that's a little bit extreme, but I'm also saying, uh, like, I think to a certain extent, if you really are serious about reaching a high level of fluency in a language that's so different than your native language, then maybe it takes a big commitment. And although you can make a lot of uh, progress after just a few hours a day, if you really want to reach that comfortable level of fluency, you might have to set aside six months of your life or to a year of your life where that's really your main focus. Okay, I mean, it all depends on what people want to do, but um, I think it makes more sense to say, okay, I'm interested in Japanese, just like I was interested. Take my Persian. I was doing Persian. I did three months of Persian in combination with Arabic. And I guess, you know, I would half the week in Arabic, half the week in Persian. But the Persian, so there's, let's say I was spending on average an hour, an hour and a half a day on Persian. I achieved a lot. I didn't achieve a fluency, but I have a sense of what Persian is all about. I can now choose to pursue it as far as I want. So with a new language, say Japanese, the person is interested in Japanese, give it three months, give it a good shot. If you manage to get in two hours a day, good for you. If it's one hour a day, good for you. And after three months, you'll have achieved something of, of value, of significance. You'll have a better understanding of the language. And then you take it the next step. I don't think a person needs to start off by saying, uh, although some people may, you know, I want to be totally perfect in Japanese. Um, you know, I, I, I never start off in a new language with the goal of becoming perfect. Uh, I, I think that's a little bit daunting. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I mean, let's be real perfect. Perfection doesn't exist even in our native language. Right. I don't really think it's about that. I just think it's about, for example, when I compare myself after one year of Japanese, a very intensive study to two years to three years to five years and even over the last two years where i focus more on pitch i notice that the quality of my interactions with native speakers has greatly improved 
And the amount of value I derive from spending time with Japanese has greatly improved. Like I remember just a few years ago, although when I watched when I watched Japanese comedy, I could understand everything they were saying. And maybe intellectually, I thought I understood why it was funny. I didn't laugh. It didn't seem funny. I thought, oh, Japanese comedy is low level. They don't, you know, they're not on our level in America. But I kept watching it and sticking with it. And I met some Japanese friends who were into Japanese comedy. And I slowly started to kind of adjust my expectations to the Japanese expectations. And now I find it quite funny. And sometimes I crack up watching Japanese comedy. And I realized that it wasn't just about the words. There was more there that it, it took for my brain to really acquire the nuances of it. Yeah. And I'm really glad I stuck with it to, to like appreciate that. And there's other things too. Like when I read uh, Japanese books and they make a little reference to some, some pop culture thing from five years ago that I actually know about, then it's a lot more funny. And it has this really cool feeling of, wow, I have all, all the connections in my brain related to Japanese that like I, I spent so much time building it up and now well, I can see the world through this totally different. For sure. And and it's almost limitless. Like if I think of Chinese, if I think of French, if I think of Russian, yeah, it's, it's limitless in terms of, even for a native speaker, in terms of what they can become familiar with, in terms of culture, in terms of, you know. Uh, yeah, well, but uh, I'm not saying it's, a, it's oh, about trying to oh, reach a specific point oh, or anything. Oh. I'm just saying that like I my experience with Japanese now is better than it was two years ago. Sure. And because I spend time with Japanese every day, I'm glad I kept kept going with it. And no, I'm not trying to get to any point. I'm just enjoying the journey. Uh, uh, but I think, OK, that's fine. But I'm just saying that for me, the goal is to communicate, which means to communicate with people. And the goal is to understand some of the culture. So to be able to understand some of what I see in movies or in TV shows, although that can take a long time. And so, yeah, it takes a long time. Listen, I'm, we're going to should cut this short at some point. We should perhaps speak a little Japanese before we finish off. Oh yeah, oh, those are. Oh, so yeah, ah, 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 で、という英語I'm going to stop you there because a lot of people don't understand Japanese. First of all, I will tell you that your Japanese is probably the best that I have heard a foreigner speak, or certainly among the best. So I'm very, very impressed Thanks. with your use of the language, with your pronunciation. And just to say that uh, I asked you what you were planning to do with your Japanese, and you were explaining that uh, a lot of Japanese learn English because uh, English is, uh, you know, necessary, practical, blah, blah, blah. There are fewer obvious practical benefits to learning Japanese. Uh, however, and I maybe we should end with that. I think the wonderful thing about language learning is we learn it for many reasons. It's a bug. You have the Japanese bug. I have oh yeah for a variety of languages. We don't necessarily learn them because we're going to make a lot of money with them. People often ask me, so you know, how can you, if you're a polyglot, what can you do? How can you make money? Polyglot doesn't make you money. 
uh, but it's a passion it's an interest it's a great satisfaction and i think what you have achieved in, in japanese is, is is tremendous it's tremendous oh, so thank you. who knows what you'll be able to do with that I, can, I only i wish you the very best of luck in your endeavors thanks, thanks so much for having me on it was great to talk okay and thank you thank you for stopping by bye for now